Today's daf we're going to be learning is Kachubo daf Samach Gimel. We're going to continue and finish our interesting stories and then move on to a new topic, which is actually not really a new topic, but I think somewhat connected. Today's daf is sponsored by Miriam and Lana Kersner, Dovin Elaine Greenstone, and families in loving memory of Danny Locke, beloved brother of Mitzi Yefen, with love and much comfort from your cousins in Israel and abroad. Today's daf is sponsored by Suri Davis Sturm for the yurt side of her grandfather, Rabbi Chaim Davis, Harav Chaim Ben Nisano who brought Daf Yomi to the five towns in 1974 at the White Shore. May his neshama have an aliyah. Okay, we're going to get started with the story of Rabbi Akiva, the very famous story. Okay, so to just review very briefly, we had a whole bunch of stories of rabbis who, okay, again, starting with the Mishnah, where the Mishnah says a husband can go away without the permission of his wife. This is, I think, the key word in all these stories. Without the permission of his wife, he's still allowed to go away. There's certain things he can do, despite the fact that she might disagree. And then he can go for 30 days, according to the Mishnah. And then we saw in the Gemara that the rabbis say, you could even go for two or three years. Now, two or three years could mean two or three years only. It could mean two or three years or meaning any time you want. And in fact, many of these stories have 12 years written down. So I'm glad to see, Art, that you would never, yes, I think many people nowadays would never do such a thing. However, times were different then, apparently. And again, you have to assume these stories are exaggerated, especially when we get to Rabbi Akiva, who lived without his wife for 24 years, and yet somehow had children. You wonder, right, there has to be some exaggeration here, because it can't really possibly be. Um, okay, so we saw these stories where the husband's either right, came, either didn't show up like they were supposed to, right? They came home at irregular intervals and then didn't and got their wives all worried. We saw husbands who just left, didn't come back, shocked their wives when they came back, right? The wives didn't realize that 12 years was some magic number and expected, oh, 12 years, okay, he's showing up, right? They basically go off and the husband shows up. We're going to go back to his story a lot today. The three last, two last stories we saw as compared to Rabbi Akiva. These two rabbis go off, and first Rabbi Hanina ben Chachinai, he comes back, all the roads are different, he doesn't recognize anything, right? It shows how much time has really passed. Then he doesn't recognize not just the streets, he doesn't recognize his own daughter. And then he basically ends up causing the death of his wife because she's so shocked. Comes the next person, Rabbi Hamar Barbisi, you heard the story of Rabbi Hanina ben Chachinai. He said, I'm not gonna let that happen to me. I'm going to be smart and write a letter to my wife. So what does he do? He comes home and where does he go? His familiar place before he gets to his house is the Beit Midrash. That's where he's comfortable. He goes there and basically um, then ends up um, basically uh, also, though, misreading all sorts of things, doesn't recognize his own son, thinks, oh, maybe I made a mistake going away to learn for so long. Look what I could have had. I could have had some son like this. In the end, he has a Tami Chacham son like this, and it's clearly not because of his doing. And maybe that's the point of this last line where Rami Barhama says, like the, the line after the story, that a chudu meshulash alom meirab tinatek, right? A, a three-threaded thread is, right? A, a, when there's three generations, that's basically going to, right, not ever fall apart. And this has a very strong, right? It's, it's almost making a mocking of it. There's a strong shoshelet here. There's Rabisa, Rabbi Chama, and then Rabbi Yoshayim. But it's really not because of anything Rabbi Chama did. Right? It's sort of, this was from some other, you know, he got lucky, but it's really not his doing that this happened, right? Normally you would say, oh, the whole thing about the shoshelet is the connection between the father and the son. And here, right, it's not just, we're talking here also, there's not just the relationship between the husband and wife. There's also clearly in these stories, the theme of the, of the father and the children, that there's also no connection between the father and the children. So again, themes, right? Parents kind of abandoning their children, father, right? Men, men abandoning their wives and not communicating, right? I really think that the key here is not communicating. And we're going to talk about communication in the story of Rabbi Akiva. So let's read the story and then we'll kind of sum up. We have one, two more stories left. Okay. You would have hoped that we ended with the story of Rabbi Akiva, which if you're familiar with the story, you know it has a positive ending, but this Gemara is not going to end with that story and end with another negative story. Rabbi Akiva Raya de Ben Kalba Savua Hava. Okay, he was a friend of Kalba Savua, Chazite Barte de Habetznia Uma'ali. He saw his daughter, who was um, Sanua. She was 
modest and she had good, um, just one second, let me check one thing. She had good midot, okay? She was a good person. He saw that and one second, let me check one quick thing. Oh, sorry, Raya. Yeah, not Raya's friend. He was the shepherd. Sorry, my mistake. No, I was my, um, knew I was wrong about something there. He was the shepherd of Kava Sabua. Okay, so he was like a, a, a mere worker. Kava Sabua looked at him as, you know, a lowly worker. Kava Sabua was very wealthy. He had this daughter who in other sources is named as Rachel. Okay, which is interesting because you'll see. Rachel is also an U. Okay, E-W-E. A U, sorry, a U. And um, we'll see some references to that later on. Chazite Barte, so he's, while he's shepherding his animals, he happens to notice the daughter in the house. I'm Raleigh, so she says to him, right, she also seems to like him, she almost initiates this whole thing. It's very funny. You always think the man is the one initiating. She kind of proposes the marriage here. She says, listen, if I get betrothed to you, will you go learn Torah? He says, yes, no problem. I'll go learn Torah. They got married secretly. And she sends him off. Okay, she is the mode, the initiator here. Okay, which is different from all the other stories. In all the other stories, it wasn't the wife who sent them out. Either it was the father, or it was the person himself. Never did you see the wife actually saying, "I want you to go away for you know to go learn." So first of all, everything noticed that Sina. There's a whole bunch of literary things going on here. He saw that she was snua, and then it says they did it bitsina. They got married secretly. Secretly from who? From the father. Father, we're going to see both here and at the end of the story, is a little bit clueless about what's going on until he then hears things. Okay, so in this case, Shama Avua, he hears. Afkami Beite, he immediately removes her from the house, kicks her out. Adrahana Ami Nichse, he says, I'm not giving you any money. You can't benefit from any of my possessions, nothing. Okay, he basically writes her out. So she's now alone. She's got nothing, no husband, no father, no family support, no financial support. But she doesn't seem to complain. So he goes to learn for 12 years. When he comes back, when he comes back, he brings with him 12,000 students. There's an obvious play here on the 12 years versus the 12,000 students, right? We know of 24,000 students from the other story of Svirat Omer, right? That they all died. Anyway, we'll get back to that in a minute. Shamelahu Saba. Now he comes into town. Before he gets home, he overhears a conversation between her and this elderly gentleman. Shamelahu Saba. So we're going to have communication here, but not direct communication. Okay. So if we talk about communication, the importance of communication, sometimes communication can happen in a way that's different from direct communication. Like you think of communication, husband and wife, you should speak one on one. But in this case, he overhears a conversation she has with somebody else and comes to the conclusion about what she wants for him. So he, here's this elderly gentleman, the Ka'amara, Ad Kama Kamidabret Al Manut Chayut. How long are you going to live like a widow when your husband's still alive? Right? This is crazy, your life. You're living like a poor widow. Your husband's not around. How long are you going to go like this for? Right? She also didn't know he was coming to town. Amrale Iladiditzai. She says, look, if he would listen to me, he would go another 12 years and learn. That's really what I want for him. Amal, so now, Rabbi Kiva overhears this conversation and comes to the conclusion that this is Berishut, she obviously wants me to go. He goes another 12 years to learn without even saying hello to her, right? So while this story is, is viewed as this amazing story, there's clearly even here some issue with communication where right, you would think he'd at least come home, maybe, right? This happens certainly with children, right? With separation anxiety. Once you see them, sometimes it's harder for them to separate from you after. So maybe he felt like maybe I shouldn't show up. Maybe it'll be harder. She won't want me to go, you know, even though she really does want me to go, right? Maybe she won't want that. So he basically disappears off the scene. Again, like I said, hard to imagine how they had children, if this is really the truth. So again, it's a story. Now, Kiata, when he comes back, now he comes back with 24,000 students. Now, again, you could say the following, right? This looks like a huge success story. How many students, right? Amazing. But if you know the story about his 24,000 students, 
who died right during the you know before Lagba Omer, that whole story. You wonder maybe there's something off here, right? There was sinat chinam between them, right? It's a little bit uh, hard to understand. So, right, it's not necessarily the most positive, but the story is looking at it as positive. But again, there's a little bit of something's not right here. Um, Shama Debitu, his wife hears that he's coming to town. Now, this is different from the other stories. <coughs> the other stories, first story, again, I'm comparing the last two. She had no idea. He just shows up and she faints and maybe dies. The second story, basically, right, she does die, but then he brings her back to life. There's different versions of the story, as I mentioned. Second story, he writes her a letter, right, when he's in town. Here, none of that was necessary because Rabbi Akiva, exactly as you're writing, he came with a whole entourage. He was a very prominent man, which also, by the way, if you think about it, what's the success story of someone going away to learn for 24 years? Rabbi Akiva, in other words, you want the, the product of Rabbi Akiva as a product of that, okay? And maybe this is also saying that if you're going to come out unique like Rabbi Akiva, maybe it's worth it. But if you're going to be like Rabbi Hanina ben Chachinai, who, who's really heard of him, or Rabbi Hamar Barbisa, these are much less known rabbis, you know, those guys can go learn, you know, a little bit here and there, learn in their town, learn, but not go, in fact, even Rabbi Hamar Barbisa, his son Rabbi Yoshaya was much more known than he is. And he didn't go away to learn. So it's also raising some other points here. Now, Shama Debitu, so she hears Avakat Nafik Lape. He's coming now. Amra Le Shivavata, her neighbors say to her, Shi'ile Mani, why don't you borrow some clothes? Livush Vikase, you'll get dressed nicely. Right? You're, you're a schlump. You have no clothes. You have no money. Your, your clothes are dregs. You don't want to go out to see your husband who hasn't been here in 24 years dressed like that. Amra Lehu, she says with a lot of confidence, Yodat Sadiq Nefesh Behemto. It's a very strange pasuk, but uh, a tzaddik knows the, the, the soul of its animal. Okay, now she's not calling herself an animal. First of all, you could say this pasuk could be read in two different ways. Either I know the nefesh of my animal, meaning I know my husband, and I know he could care less how I'm going to be dressed, okay? Or he knows where I'm at. He knows he's left me as a poor widow, and he knows this is who I am. I'm not going to dress up and try to be someone I'm not. And also, maybe he knows, like, this is who I am. He loves me for who I am and not for how I'm dressed, okay? A very interesting one. Kimati Legabe, when she reaches him, I want you to remember what she does, because this is going to appear later in the story. Nafla alapa, she bows down on, on, her, on her face. She kisses his feet. Okay, this sounds like at a rock concert, right? Everyone's grabbing onto the person and, you know, you have people pushing them away, you know, or, or a king comes by and everybody wants to grab onto his clothes and everyone, you know, make way. This is, this is a prominent person. You can't have some poor woman dressed in dregs grabbing at his feet. Right? They obviously have no idea who she is. Amar Lahu, great line. He says, Shivkua, leave her be. Shali Vishalachem Shalahu. Everything that we've become, right? You're my students. So whoever you are and whoever I've become is all because of her. She is, she gets this chuyot for everything, right? She's the woman responsible for all this. Leave her be. Shama Avua to Ataga. Okay, so that's the scene. She goes to him, okay, as opposed to the other stories where he goes to her. Here, she knows he's coming. She goes out to greet him. She's all fine. She's not in a panic because she did this, right? She caused this whole thing to happen. And he recognizes her in this whole story, right? And the other stories, notice he never says anything about his wife and the sacrifices she made for him. Now, Shama Avua, the Atagava Rabba Now we go to the father. The father hears what? Now, in the first story, he hears they got married, right? He got the whole story. And Maybe he's missing something, which is he doesn't know that Rabbi Kiva's gone to learn, probably. We don't know. But now Rabbi Kiva's coming to town. He has no idea that this is his son in law. So he hears that Atagapa Rabba Lamata, a big, big shot, is coming to town, a big rabbi. Amar Ezel Habe says, I want to go greet him. Efshar de Mefer Nidra. Maybe he will undo my vow. In other words, at this point, He's obviously gotten wind of the fact that Rabbi Kiva has been sitting learning for all these years, and maybe he's willing to forego his neder. But he needs an important, prominent rabbi to undo his neder. So, oh, here's a great rabbi coming to town. 
why don't I go see if he can undo the, the vow? So now, he goes to him. So he tells him what he did. Rabbi Kiva says to him, did you take the vow thinking that maybe he'd be a great man? In other words, this is always the way you undo a vow. You say, had I known, I never would have taken this vow. So he says, would you have taken this vow? Had you known he would become a great man? He feels so bad. He says, even if I knew he was just going to learn one chapter, just one halacha. You have to remember, he knew Rabbi Akiva. He knew that he knew nothing. And that's why he didn't want to marry him to marry his wife his daughter. But if he had just learned any one thing, you could feel that here is remorse. I definitely would never have made this nid. Amarle, here's the big line. Anna, who I am he. Okay. So the nid is gone. Nafalal ape, here's the reaction of the father-in-law. Very interesting. Exactly the same reaction as her. You're going to see this theme of parents doing like their children or children doing like their parents. Nafalal ape, he bows down on the ground. Nashkal kari kisses his feet. And he gives him half of his money. Barte, okay, so that's the end of the story, basically. But there's one little addition to the story. Barte de Rabbi Akiva, the daughter of Rabbi Akiva, of Dalela ben Azai Hafi. She did the exact same thing to Ben Azai. This is great. The, the U goes after the U, and it's a play on Rachel and Rachel. So I saw someone ask before, maybe he had children not with Rachel, not with her. It's not true. Because here we're saying the daughter he had from her did the exact same thing as the mother and sent her husband off to learn for many years. Right, The same way the mother, that's the way the daughter is, like mother, like daughter. Interesting how also the father and the daughter did similar actions, even though they obviously in the beginning did different actions. At the end, their reaction to Rabbi Kiva was the same. Um, she obviously learned that at home, right? This is how you show respect for for important people. Um, and obviously, that if you remember from Chagiga, Arba'anich Nesula Pardes, two of them were Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azad, which is very interesting. It's interesting, number one, that, you know, keep the wealth in the family, right? He basically married his daughter off to someone who was as brilliant as he was. And maybe also that theme about this maybe only works with brilliant people who are going to be, you know, unique in that way and not just the average person who learns. You know, maybe this is too extreme for them, but maybe in unique circumstances, this is okay. And again, the main thing, which is obvious, I said in the beginning, I'll say it at the end, notice the words bereshut come up here, and it's all bereshut, which is very different, right? Which she wanted this, which is very, very different. Not only does she want it, but she initiated it. It's not like he said, can I do it? Remember we talked about yesterday, if he wants to take a change in salary or if she agrees to something, she might not 100% agree. In this case, she initiated, she said it, she wanted it. So it was clear 100% without any shed of a doubt that this is what she wanted. But the stories end with a very interesting story. Uh, well, not, I don't know, interesting, but it is interesting, but in an interesting manner to end because you would have thought, okay, we have negative, negative, negative end with positive. No. Rav Yosef Bereda Rava, Shadre Avua Lebeirav Lekamed Rav Yosef. We don't get confused with the Rav Yosefs. We have number one, Rav Yosef, the son of Rava. Rava was fourth generation Amora. Rav Yosef is obviously the next generation, fifth. And the Rav Yosef we always talk about in the Gemara is the rabbi of Abaye, who's obviously a generation above. He also taught Rava. He's a generation above. He's third generation. So Rava, the fourth generation, sends his son, fifth generation, to marry to learn with Rav Yosef, the third generation rabbi. So let's read it inside. Rav Yosef Berei de Rava, the son of Rava. Shadre Avuay, his father sends him Lebei Rav, Lekame de Rav Yosef. Sends him to the Beit Midrash to learn with Rav Yosef. Paskule Shichne. They determined for him that he should learn for six years. Who's they? Maybe Rav and Rav Yosef. Not clear, but probably. Combination of the two, they decided you should learn for six years. And he was married. Ki after three years, Matamale Yom Kippur, the Erev Yom Kippur comes. Remember, our first story was with Erev Yom Kippur. So we're now going back to the Erev Yom Kippur. And if you remember, the guy was supposed to show up Erev Yom Kippur. He didn't show up and they think he's dead, right? And then they um, they turn over his bed and all that, right? Oh, no, that was the one. I'm confusing the two stories. That was the one where he just didn't show up. And then she starts crying and the he falls from the attic. So now... 
Erev Yom Kippur, right? We talked about them, why Erev Yom Kippur? So you could look at Erev Yom Kippur in two ways, right? Number one, can't do Tashmi Shemitah, which is very interesting. That's the whole, right? Whole idea of coming back home to your wife is to be with your wife. You can't really be with her. On the other hand, it's a day that we start thinking about tshuva, um, thinking about being starting to, right? Before Yom Kippur, we start thinking about our lives and maybe that's why it made him want to come home. Um, so he comes from Erev Yom Kippur. Amar, Ezel ve'itchazinu la'anshe beti. He says, I want to go and be seen to my family. Shama avui. Ravi hears that he's coming home. Shakil mana unafik la'ape. As opposed to Rabbi Akiva, when they go to greet him, they go out and they kiss him and they're so excited. Comes the father with weapons in his hands. Okay, he's ready for a fight. He's very upset that he's coming home before the six years are up. Amarle, here comes his big retort. Zonat Khanis karta, did you remember your mistress? Okay, what, you know, what, you're just looking to have relations with your wife? Okay, you know, it's, again, it's strange because it's coming home in Yom Kippur, but still saying what, like, you miss your wife so bad, like, you're supposed to learn Torah now. This is not the time for that. Ikid Amri, some people say it was a bit of a toned down wording. Amrle, Yonat Chani's karta, did you remember your dove, your beloved? Okay, in a bit of a nicer tone, but still, not the time right now. Itrid, they started arguing about this. Lomar ifsik, the lomar ifsik. And neither one ate the pseudo mafseka. Could you imagine the scene, right? Arab Yom Kippur, you're hissing about the holiest of days you're, where you're supposed to make amends with everybody. And here there's this huge fight and nobody ends up eating the pseudo mafseka. Okay, which is really interesting about this whole, you know, if you notice the word ifsik in the beginning, pasku, right? It's the same, it's the same root where they determine this is what he's supposed to do. And here no one got to eat the meal. And maybe it's maybe it's a critique on Rava saying he shouldn't have determined Mirosh what someone else is supposed to do. And maybe the wife should have been involved, and maybe we should have asked the husband what he wants. And that, you know, you're kind of ruining relationships and you don't see that there's a value to the relationship at all. Or maybe he was wrong because he was supposed to learn Torah. Is that it's not really clear from the story who is in the wrong and uh, and that. Okay, if you haven't listened yet to Karen Miller Jackson's Shirim, she has two Shirim up on our site, two short Shirim, about 20 minutes each, about these stories, a bit more of an analysis. Okay, again, my theory is that the whole theme is all about communication here and and uh, and about trying, I would say, to minimize fighting, right? And as even here, you see the fighting imagery and the fighting between husband and wife. And we're going to get right now, which is why I think the next thing is really connected to someone who's moredet or a man who's moled, who basically rebels against their spouse. And right, this is all about how to figure out how to, on the one hand, right, we all struggle with this, how to have a career and also have a marriage and how to combine the two, you know, and probably the secret to success is communicating about, you know, and finding the right balance between all these things. Okay, moving on to the moled. So now we have a woman who's moledet al ba'ala. We actually made reference, we saw this mission earlier, She's moredet abala. She basically decides she's rebelling against him. We don't yet know in what, what she rebels against in what area. We're going to see Machlofa and the Gemara about it, so we'll hold off right now. But she's obviously doing something serious against her husband. We do seven dinarim every Shabbat. Okay, Ketubah's 200 dinarim. So, right, if you do the math, I did this, but I don't remember now what it came out to. 200 divided by seven, you get to 28. Okay. So if you have 200 zoos, it's 28. If you have Tosefet or anything else, then it becomes more. So it's 28 weeks or more than that, right? Any, every, right? The Ketubah and the Tosefet and possibly also the Nechzei Tzombarz, the things she brings in, he keeps deducting from her, okay? And um, he deducts every week. And then until they get to zero, at zero, he says, okay, if you haven't changed your mind about this, I'm divorcing you. Now, the goal here is to buy time. Why do we want to buy time? Because we want to buy time so that she'll change her mind, hopefully. Rabbi Yehuda, because in the end, we want them to be married. Rabbi Yehuda, Omer Shiva Tarpiki'in. Okay, seven Tarpiki'in, that's a type of coin. We don't know exactly what it is. In the Gemara later, they're going to uh, explain it. Not today. So to what extent does he keep going down? To when? As I said, until the ketubah is at zero. Rabbi Yossi Omer, he has a different approach. 
he can keep staying married to her. He doesn't have to give her a divorce yet and keep a tally, seven dinarim every week. If the tube is at zero, we'll go to minus seven, minus 14, et cetera. And if she ever inherits something else, we'll take it from there. So this could go on forever. Same thing if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do to the wife, which we're going to have to see what that is. Mosifin al tubatach, the shadin rim de Shabbat. She gets added to her tuba every week, three dinarim. Rabbi Yuda says, shloshat tarpikiin, three of this other coin. Okay, why the difference? We'll get to it again, not today, but later in the Gemara. So the, today we want to figure out what is a moledet mimai. Moledet mimai. Rafuna amar mitash mishamita. She refuses to sleep with him, to have relations. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chavai, that seems pretty basic. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanina, Amar, Mimilacha. Remember, the woman has certain rights of work she's supposed to do, jobs she's supposed to do for the husband. She refuses to do those jobs. So now we're going to have two questions against Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanina. Tanan says in the Mishnah, Vachena, Moreda, Lishto. Our Mishnah says she's Moreda mo to him and he can be Moreda mo to her. Now, if you remember, there was nothing on the list of Melachot he needs to do for her. Like I saw someone made a joke about, doesn't he at least need to take out the garbage, right? But um, he doesn't have a list of milachot for him. So therefore, they say, So it works perfectly if you say, either she refuses to have relations with him or he refuses to have relations with her. Those are the two sides, she being a moledet or he being a moled. But if you say it's from doing jobs, he doesn't have any responsibilities to her in terms of work. To which the Gemara says, of course he does. In Bomer, any Zambe, any Mifranes. He's supposed to give her food, support. If he says, I'm not going to feed you at all, I'm not going to support you, well, that would be a rebellion. Because remember, she's giving him her salary. And if he doesn't give her food, that's that's a rebellion. Bahama Rab, one minute. Didn't Rav say, now again, what would this mean? Fill it into the Mishnah. If he doesn't provide her food, Every week he has to add to the tuba three, right? As a way to basically deter him from doing that. But what doesn't it say? He divorces her immediately. So the Gemara is going to ask on that. Bahama Rav, didn't Rav say, Someone who says, I'm not going to support my wife, has to divorce her. We issue what we call a chiyuv get. You have to divorce her right now. And he gives her a tuba. So to which they say, Even when Rav said that, First, we have to try to, limluche means to basically get involved and say to him, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. There's a concern here, and this is what I think is underlying the entire Mishnah. There's a concern that people get angry at each other, okay? Married people know that, right? Happens, people who aren't married see it, right? People who are, can see it with close friends, right? The closer you are to a person, sometimes it creates the most tension, or parents, child, also spouses. So, because of that, they're worried that people will act in an act of anger and then later regret it. So therefore, they want to buy time. So even if husband says, I'm not supporting you, it could be in a moment of anger. So it's true he has to divorce her, but we give a little bit of time and we try to encourage him. So therefore, you could say that that's moled. Okay, so Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina could fit with the Mishnah. And we could say, that's his mirida, that's his rebellion. He has to, every if he refuses to support her, every week he has to give her three denarii. At a certain point, we're going to force him to give her a tuba, but not immediately. Meitive. Now we have another source against Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina. Now this is the end of a brighta that we're going to quote the brighta in a minute and learn the entire brighta. But right now we're just taking a line from it. Echat li, arusa, meaning echat li means I see it that this is the case for. Uh, it's a very strange language. We don't usually see it in brighta. Arusa unisu'ava, filu nidava, filu cholava, filu shomeri kebam. These are all women that the laws of Moed would, Moed would apply to. A woman who's betrothed, who the time came for her to get married and she refuses to marry him. That's basically saying, I refuse to have relations with you or I refuse to work for you. Okay. And we're going to have to plug in each one to each of these cases. A married woman who refuses one of these things. A Nida, even if she's a Nida, she refuses one of these things. We're going to have to get back to this later. A Filu Chola, even if she's sick, if she refuses, again, to have relations or to work. And a filu shomer yabam, shomer yabam is a woman who's supposed to marry the brother and she doesn't. Hey, he's willing to marry her and she doesn't want to do it. Those are all considered moreh. And then again, we'd start deducting. Or whatever laws of are relevant, which we're going to see. The laws in that bright are going to be a little bit different than our Mishnah. So I'm going to skip the parentheses. Okay, some people have it in the, some people don't. In any case, this these lines are going to come up 
when we quote the entire bright and we're going to ask this question so we can hold off till then. Usually parentheses means it shouldn't be in the printed text. If she's sick and she refuses to have relations with him, that can be considered a morid. Because even if you're sick, you could still have relations. Uh, depends how sick you are, obviously. Ella, turning out Amubet, Lemanda Amar Mi Melacha. But if you say it's from doing work, if you're sick in bed, you're not supposed to be doing the jobs in the house. So she wouldn't be doing Malacha. You can't explain that Mishnah as doing that she says, I refuse to work. What do you mean? She's sick in bed. Of course she can't work. That's not called a moredet, someone who refuses to do what she's supposed to do for her husband. So they answer and they re they understand the machloka now in a bit of a different way. Again, one said, Rav Huna said, it's mitash me shamita, and Rabbi Yossi Rav Hina said it's from Malach. So now we're going to understand Rabbi Yossi a little bit differently. Rabbi Yossi Rav Hina was saying, wasn't saying a moredet is not someone who refuses to have relations with her husband and only someone who won't do the jobs she's supposed to do. It's in addition. Yes, obviously, mitash mish is a moled. And that's how he reads this bright. This bright is obviously talking about the one, the woman who refuses to have relations with her husband. But he pligi me malach. Okay, their machloket is about if she doesn't do her work. Mar savar mi malacha lo havya moledet. To mar savar mi malacha nami havya moledet. Rav Huna says, not doing jobs in the house, that doesn't mean she's a rebellious wife, okay? It's not doing work. First of all, work can always be done by somebody else. You can always hire someone. That's not the same. But, but Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina says, even if she refuses to do the jobs, she's willing to have relations with him, but she's refusing to do the jobs she's supposed to do. That's also considered a moed. Okay, so that's the debate between them. And therefore, that brighta doesn't, doesn't create a problem. Now we're going to read the entire brighta, gufa. That's exactly like our mission. But now we get a big shift. The rabbis got together and voted on changing things. They didn't like this 28 weeks or more kind of situation. That's just schlepping it along. Yes, we need to intervene, but not that much, okay? Yes, we need to push it off and let them get over their anger and maybe they'll change their minds, but not that long, okay? Not that there's really no end time in, in place there or the end time is much farther off. What do we do? They announce about it four weeks, Zohar Zo, perhaps even on, on Shabbat specifically when people gather together, right? Otherwise people are out in the fields, people are doing other things, their jobs, but four Shabbatot, one after the other, and they sent her messages from the court that say to her, Do you know that your ketuba, it's even if it's only that you're losing all that? And here comes that line that we saw before, whether it's an arusa, a betrothed woman, a nisua, a filu nida, a filu chola, a filu shomeret yabam, even all those people. Okay, I see you're pointing out in the chat that Shabbatot is weeks and not Shabbat, it's true. Shabbatot in general in the Gemara means weeks. That's why I said it's possibly talking about Shabbat. And we're going to see that later because the Gemara is going to talk about it, that it must be on Shabbatot. You'll see it in a minute. So it's true, though. It is really means weeks, but we're going to see that they, they seem to mean Shabbat specifically. Okay, so according to this, the rabbis shifted this halakha, changed it, and said, we're not going to give her that much time. Nida bat tashmishi. Now we're going to go back to that question about the nida, which appeared before in the parentheses, but here it appears again. And we're going to read it here. How could you say that a woman who's in nida could be a moreda? She, if, maybe she's always a moreda. She's not having relations with her husband, right? Obviously, she's not because she's in nida and she's not allowed to. But how could you say she's moreda if she says, I refuse to have relations with you? She refuses anyway because she's in nida. Amarle, and the same answer we gave yesterday to a different question. Yesterday was reversed. It was she feels that way. Here it's him feeling that way. His wife says to him, I refuse to have relations with you, even though right now she can't because she's a Nida, but she's saying it in general. And if he knows that she's going to get out of Nida and she'll have relations with him, then he's, it's fine. He manages the few days that they can't be together, right? Knowing that he has bread in his basket, which is just a metaphor, um, 
for the fact that he can have relations with her when she's out of it. But if she says, I'm not willing to have relations with you, then it's very upsetting to him. So even when she's in need, she could be a moled. If she says, when I get out of need, I'm not going to have relations with you, that would be a moled. Comes Rami Barham and he adds two alachot about this. Number one, Ami Rami Barham, and that's maybe the proof that it was specifically Shabbat. They do it on the weekend, on the, on the Shabbatot, because that's when people gather in the Batei Knesiot and the Batei Midrashot, and that's when you're going to get the most people, and that's where they would do it. They didn't do it in the Shuk. Like you would think maybe another place to announce would be in the middle of the Shuk. No, they do it in the Beit Knesset and the Beit Midrash. What's the point of the announcement? So the commentaries talk about, just what Reed points out, two things. Some of the others say some, one of the things, not the other, but he adds the second, which is, Number one, you want everyone to know about it so that it will embarrass her. And if it embarrasses her, maybe she'll change her mind. Number two, it's very private, this issue. If you make it public, her family members might hear now. Right? What's the best way sometimes to resolve conflict? Get family members involved, not always. But sometimes they can convince her to do the right thing, as they say. Okay, if it's the right thing, right? We don't know. Why she's more it, we don't know. But we're assuming, you know, she doesn't have great cause. Okay, we're going to see soon. The Gemara is going to ask. What exactly is she saying when she's moled? What's her motivation? Or not exactly, right? We're, we're going to see and we're going to distinguish between two different types of claims she can make. Amarav. Daikanami, and here is the proof. Rav says, we can further prove this. Wasn't me saying it, it was Rav saying it, which is because it says Arba Shabbatot. He understands Shabbatot here is Shabbat and not weeks, even though generally what Ruth, you were saying is right, which is Shabbat usually means weeks. Amarami Barham. He says, in addition, when it says the Beitin sends to her, they do it twice. First of all, it makes perfect sense. Once in the beginning, before they humiliate her in public, they send a court to her and say, listen, do you know that if you do this, you're going to lose your old ketubah, it might not be worth it to you. Then after they do the four achrazot and she still doesn't change her mind, they do one last ditch effort and they go to her and they speak to her and they say, maybe you want to change your mind. After that, he divorces her and she loses her ketubah. Again, she is breaking the contract. Darash Rav Nachem Bar now we have two approaches, really three, but there's one. We penalize him financially every week. It's a debate about how much, but okay, that's a side machloka. Or do we do this four-week thing and be done with it, right? With court warning, court warning. So Darash Rav Nachem Bar Rav Rav Nachem Bar said, we paskin like the rabbis who change things. Basically, we go by the four weeks. Amarava, hi, Borcha. That's nonsense. Some people say Borcha, the Aruch, which is the early, the earliest dictionary of Aramaic, says it comes from the Lashon of Bor. Bor is a fool. Okay, so, or someone who doesn't have much of a brain. So this is brainless, what you're saying. No way, no how, right? And also the Misha didn't say that. Amarava, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, my Borcha te. Why? How? So now, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak comes to support Rav Nachman Bar Rav Chista against Rava and says, my Borchate, why do you think this is nonsense? Ana Amarita Niele, I told him this. Don't think he said this himself. I told him this. And not only that, and I learned it in the name of Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Hanina. So don't just push it aside and say this is silly. So who did he hold like Rava? There's this machloket about what Rav Sheshet said. And Rav said that Rav Sheshet said, we're supposed to nimlachimba. We're supposed to give her time to change her mind, right? It's all about, do we think she'll change her mind or not? So he said, we have to give her time to change her mind. And therefore he holds by the Mishnah's halacha. Whereas Rav Huna Bar Yehuda said in the name of Rav Sheshet, we don't need to give her that much time to change her mind. What exactly this means is a bit of a debate about Rav Huna Bar Rav Yehuda, what he said, I'm going to leave that aside. Now the Gemara asks, what is a moled? What does she say when she claims, I'm not going to either have relations or I'm not going to do work? What does she claim? I want to be married to him, but I want to torture him. In other words, I really hate this person. Now, in that case, we assume she's in a moment of anger. We want to try to change her mind. And that's why we have all these laws. However, but if she says, he is despicable to me, then we do not force her, okay? Now, this is very interesting. What does that mean we don't force her? Here, there's a very big, interesting machloket. Rashi says, lo kaifina la, la we don't make her stay married to him. 
Now, how can we prevent that? Ella no la get ktuba. He gives her a get and she goes without a ktuba. In other words, she does doesn't get a ktuba, but he gives her a get. And Chosfo quotes this in the Dibor Matchel of Ambrama, Isala lo kafinale, quotes Rashi in the last in the end of that first line. The Yesh Mefarshin de Kofin Otolotzi. Some people say that from Rashi, what he means is we can force her, we can issue a chiyuv get. This is a super important issue for Misurave get, women who can't get gets, who are stuck. According to this, if she says, I don't want to be married to him, right? He's despicable to me, then we can force him to give her a get. Okay? That means we can start putting sanctions and all that. It makes it much easier once you can issue a chiyuv get. And the Rambam, in fact, says the same thing. I'm going to read you the Rambam, Hilchot Ishu. Uh, Perak for chapter 14, number eight, halacha eight. If she refuses to give her husband uh, relations, he moreid. She's called a moreid. And they ask her, why are you doing this? Listen, he's disgusting. I can't be with him. He says it explicitly. We force him to divorce her. We can't in, we can't chain a woman and make her force her to be captive to a man who she hates. Okay, so she loses her ketubah and all that, but we can force again. Rabbeinu Tam, right there after those words, says, rather Rabbeinu Tam, he totally disagrees with this, because we're worried that maybe she has eyes for somebody else, and she's just using this. And because of that, most of the authorities actually hold like Rabbeinu Tam, and it makes it much more difficult in the Beit Din Rabbani to issue what we call a chiyuv get, to force. It's it's a very difficult process to get to the stage where we can start putting sanctions on the husband because of this machloket, okay? We're not going to go into it any more in depth, but you should know that it all comes from this, or a lot of it comes from this stop. Part of the reason Rabbeinu Tam says this is because when it talks about all kinds of cases where you can issue a chiyuv get, this is not listed there. So he claims this obviously isn't one of them. Okay. Marzutra Amar Kaifina. So now we say, wait, but Marzutra disagrees and he says, there's always hope. We really should try to force her to stay married to him a little longer and see if we can convince her. And in fact, have Uvda Ba'achpe Marzutra, he forced, he got them to stay married. And we're going to assume it was a happy marriage because nothing mean Rabbi Chanina Misura, because this big rabbi came from that marriage, from that union after they had this whole fight and after she was Moredet. And that's proof, he claims, that they would only have a, a son that was so worthy if it was a good marriage. That's a part one can argue against, but that was his understanding. You can't use this as an example. This had the hand of God in it. And, you know, because of that, this was a different situation and you can't learn from here to anything else. So his opinion is kind of pushed aside. We're going to end with the story of the Kalav Rav Zvid. She was married to Rav Zvid's son. Imarda, and she was a Moleda. We're going to have the first version of the story today. The second version we'll see tomorrow. Habatvisa had Shiva. She grabbed a cloak, right? A, a jacket or something of hers to take with her when she was leaving the marriage. Yet, and now remember, she's not supposed to get her ketubah. But the question is, is that part of the ketubah or not? Yet, if Amemar Merzutra, they sat and said, um, Virav Ashi, Okay, the Amemar Merzutra and Ashi were sitting. The Yatav Rav Gamda Gabayu, he was with them. Yatve the Kaamre, they said, Marda Hivsida Blautek. I mean, she loses even her clothes she brought into the marriage, even though they're now a little bit worn out. She loses them. That's also his because it was in the Ketuba. Amarlu Rav Gamda. Rav Gamda says, What are you trying to do? You're trying to flatter Rav Zvid. Mishum to Rav Zvid, Gavarabba Machintitule. What you're trying to flatter him because he's an important person and do things, Paskin Halacha, in the benefit of his son against Halacha. Rav Kahana said that Rav asked this question and didn't answer it, meaning he wasn't, it wasn't clear who the Blaot go to, and therefore if she already grabbed it, it's in her possession. Anyone who wants to take it out of her possession would have to prove it, and therefore can prove it, and therefore she gets to keep it. That's the first version of the story. The second version we'll see in tomorrow's stuff. That's it for today. Have a great day, everyone.